name is Anne Morfitt, and I am doing my presentation on respiratory distress syndrome in newborns. Respiratory distress syndrome occurs in newborns with underdeveloped lungs. The disease is mainly caused by a lack of surfactant in the baby's lungs. Surfactant helps the baby's lungs to fill with oxygen and the alveoli to stay open. For newborns to be able to breathe easily, the alveoli must be opened and filled with air. Surfactant coats the surface of the air sacs where it lowers the surface tension and allows the air sacs to remain open throughout the respiratory cycle. Usually, production of surfactant begins about 32 weeks of pregnancy. Therefore, the more premature the newborn, the less surfactant is available, and the greater likelihood that respiratory distress syndrome will develop. Here I have a picture of normal inflated alveoli and collapsed alveoli, just so you can picture it as I discuss the respiratory distress syndrome cycle in the next slide. So if the alveoli have collapsed or haven't even opened on the first breath, the infant will require excess energy to reopen the collapsed alveoli with every breath. Expiratory atelectasis prevents sufficient gas exchange, decreasing lung compliance and making it harder for the newborn to breathe. This leads to hypoxia, respiratory acidosis, and metabolic acidosis. If these symptoms are not treated aggressively, this can lead to respiratory failure and death. Nursing implications include assessing the newborn for risk factors such as premature birth, mom with diabetes, baby with symptoms of hypoxia, and baby with symptoms of uterine hypoxia. Clinical manifestations may be present at birth or within a few hours after birth. Signs and symptoms to look out for a tachypnea, expiratory grunt, nasal flaring on inspiration, subcostal and intercostal retractions, pallor and stenosis, apneas over 15 seconds, and labored breathing. So I've decided that the best way to describe a baby with respiratory distress syndrome is to show you the difference between a baby born with respiratory distress and a baby born without. The, the baby in the first video actually has pneumonia. However, you can see that the baby has nasal flaring, marked subcostal and intercostal recession. At the end of the video, you can hear a small expiratory grunt. All symptoms of a newborn with respiratory distress syndrome. The second video is primarily for comparison. It's a normal baby born at term. It's actually a little different than a normal baby as they usually come out crying, but this baby is happy, beautifully pink and perfused, and there's a symmetric rise and bowl to the chest. Respiratory distress syndrome is diagnosed by a chest x-ray. As you can see in this picture, characteristics of RDS are portions of the air-filled tracheal bronchial tree outlined by a uniformed bilateral white. The root eight is the atelectasis. Diagnosis for respiratory distress syndrome is based on the symptoms, levels of oxygen in the blood, and abnormal chest x-ray results. Nursing implications also include the nurse's ongoing assessment for respiratory distress syndrome. As I stated before, the symptoms may be apparent immediately after delivery, or it could take hours for the newborn to exhibit respiratory symptoms. Therefore, it's imperative that the nurse performs regular respiratory assessments on the newborn. She does this through inspection. 
Does the infant have an increased work of breathing? Color is the skin and mucous membranes. Pink, dusty, pale, or blue? What is the respiratory effort like? Do they have nasal flaring, grunting, substernal and intercostal retractions? The nurse is also assessing the newborn's vital signs. Do they have tachypnea? Respirations over 60 breaths per minute. Or tachycardia, heart rate over 160 beats per minute. Do they have decreased oxygen saturations? The nurse's assessment also include auscultating for bilateral air entry. These assessments are extremely important to be able to identify and proactively manage and treat respiratory distress syndrome in the newborn. The risk of respiratory distress syndrome is greatly reduced if delivery can be delayed until the fetus's lungs have produced sufficient surfactant. The baby's lungs have matured to a point where the infant can breathe on their own at 34 weeks gestation. When premature birth cannot be avoided, the mother is given an injection of a corticosteroid. This accelerates the fetus's production of surfactant, and within 48 hours, the premature lungs have matured to a point that the severity and incidence of Respiratory distress syndrome is reduced. Newborns with mild respiratory distress may require only supplementary oxygen. Their supportive treatment includes blood gas monitoring, correction of base imbalance, temperature regulation, nutrition, and protection from infection. Newborns with severe respiratory distress may require oxygen delivered by CPAP. They may need to be intubated with an ETT tube and, and or may require mechanical ventilation to help them breathe. Surfactant therapy is given through the ETT tube immediately after birth as a sort of measure before symptoms develop or as a treatment measure for infants that have presenting symptoms. This treatment can be repeated several times until symptoms of respiratory distress syndrome resolve. There has been much debate about when it is optimal to give surfactant therapy to a neonate who has either been diagnosed or has risk factors for developing RDS. Current research indicates that surfactant should be given as early as school after birth as it reduces the severity of respiratory distress syndrome, incidence of a pneumothorax, and neonatal death. Current studies are being conducted to update standards on administration, dosage, and preparation to help improve clinical outcomes for premature babies requiring surfactant therapy. Studies to date have been inconclusive. Increased urination may be an indicator that the baby's respiratory function is improving. The nursing implications for this include closely monitoring input and output, because as the fluid moves out of the lungs into the bloodstream, the alveoli open up. Kidney perfusion increases, which leads to an increased urine production. Nursing implications for nursing education is to provide the parents with education and information regarding the newborn status. The nurse should explain all interventions and the use of equipment. They need to provide emotional support and explain supportive care that the parents can provide. Thank you so much for listening to my speech and I hope you enjoyed it.